There's a lot of talk these days about inequality, but the focus is usually on our own country. You may not realize that if you live in the United States and make an income of at least $60,000 a year, you are the global 1%. To be in the global 10%, it only takes an income of about $20,000 a year. I know, I know, statistics. It can be hard to internalize what these numbers mean. An amazing website called Dollar Street might help. They sent photographers into people's homes around the world to document daily life, and then arranged the photos by monthly income. Let's take a look. Here we are looking at bedrooms around the world, sorted by monthly income. When we look at high income households, it's amazing to me how hard it is to tell what country each is in. Now let's look at low income households. Again, each bedroom looks remarkably similar, despite large differences in location and culture. This occurs across every category. Here are toilets in high income households around the world. And again, in low income households. Looking at Dollar Street, you're left with the impression that the peoples of the world are less divided by race and culture than they are by income. And the gap is huge. The median wealth in Canada is $100,000, while the median wealth in Cameroon is only $1,000. The median wealth in Switzerland is $220,000, while the median wealth in Sudan is $220,000, one thousandth as much. This doesn't mean that inequality in the rich world isn't a problem. It is, but we should acknowledge the massive global gap between rich and poor. Poverty that occurs far away and out of sight should still be worthy of our moral consideration. Imagine walking by a pond and seeing a child drowning. The pond is not deep or dangerous, but you will ruin your clothes by wading in. So to save the child's life, there will be a small cost. Do we have a moral obligation to help? Yes. Now, imagine the child isn't drowning, but dying of malaria, and not in front of you, but in a poor country. You can have high confidence that the medicine you send both works and will arrive in time. Most people say that we still have a moral obligation to help, and while many feel that distance lessens that obligation, imagine how you'd feel if the tables were turned. You're dying, and a stranger over a thousand times richer than you could jump in and save your life with minimal cost to themselves. Wouldn't you think they should do so? Over the last 30 years, the world really has been getting better. We've halved child mortality, and there are now less than a quarter of people living in extreme poverty as before. Some countries like China, India, and Indonesia have made astonishing improvements in living conditions, and other countries like Ghana, Rwanda, and Ethiopia seem on very positive trajectories. But many places are on track to be left behind. Countries like Madagascar, Liberia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo have seen flat incomes for decades. By 2030, some 500 million people are still projected to live in extreme poverty. Why is this? There are many drivers of extreme poverty. Bad geography is one. Being landlocked makes it expensive to transport people and goods. Tough climates hinder agricultural productivity, and warm temperatures increase the prevalence of disease. Malaria alone kills hundreds of thousands every year. Weak governance also keeps countries poor. Corruption diverts funds away from health and education. Poorly run schools squander potential. And violence leads to systemic underinvestment. We might also look at the drivers of extreme poverty through the lens of systemic oppression. In the Congo, in addition to slavery and brutal labor practices, the Belgians banned Africans from many professions, so by the time of independence in 1960, there were no Congolese doctors or secondary school teachers in a country of 15 million people. The roots of political instability likewise run deep. Colonizers often drew borders arbitrarily, dividing traditionally unified groups and sowing the seeds of future conflict. Here's a map of African ethnolinguistic groups overlaid with modern borders. One 2016 study estimated that African homelands partitioned by colonial borders saw 57% more political violence than those that weren't. More recently, unfair agricultural policies have systemically disadvantaged the poor. Rich countries spend tens of billions of dollars a year subsidizing various crops. These crops then flood low-income countries with unfairly cheap goods, destroying the livelihoods of poor farmers. Haiti, once self-sufficient in food production, now imports 80% of its rice from the United States, in part due to these multi-billion dollar subsidies. 
Here's Bill Clinton apologizing for U.S. rice policies in Haiti back in 2010. Many countries have realized how destructive crop subsidies are, so there has been some reform in recent years, but the problem remains. The point here is that the drivers of extreme poverty are complex and systemic. We need to stop telling simplistic narratives or searching for silver bullets. It's never just education, or corruption, or disease, or violence, or geography, or unfair trade, or colonialism. It's all of these things and more. So what can we do about this? Many of these problems are deeply entrenched and raise complex questions about governance, human nature, the structure of the economy, and reparations for systemic oppression. These are complicated issues. People have worked their whole lives just trying to better understand what's going on. So instead of debating how to solve poverty, a more tractable question might be, what can we do that works? What improves lives and reduces suffering? Over the last few decades, we've learned a lot about what kind of aid benefits the poor. In part, this is due to the increasing use of randomized, controlled trials. While common in medicine, only in the last 20 years or so have they been applied to global development. They compare a poverty intervention between a treatment group, which receives the benefit, to a control group, which doesn't. While they have many shortcomings, they've proven to be a useful tool in evaluating the effectiveness of aid programs. One of their main findings is that some seemingly obvious ways to help, like drilling wells, microfinance, or clean cookstoves, have surprisingly limited evidence of effectiveness. Other programs, like providing free bed nets that prevent malaria, are highly effective, but they aren't as visceral as drilling wells, so donors pay less attention to them. One great organization that evaluates poverty interventions is called GiveWell. Rather than assess every charity, GiveWell's goal is to find the very best opportunities to save lives and reduce suffering. They publish the full details of this analysis online, along with a list of top charities. These charities are all characterized by high cost effectiveness, a need for more funding, and transparency. Another good option is to just give the extreme poor cash directly. Many development experts recommend cash transfers because their benefits are well studied and easy to track. Giving directly lets an individual choose how best to reduce their own hardship, so it sidesteps patronizing judgments about what the poor need. It also doesn't distort local economies, which is what usually happens when we donate free stuff. Studies repeatedly show that recipients responsibly spend this cash on basic needs like shelter, food, education, or starting a small business. There's no evidence of large increases in spending on items like alcohol or tobacco. You can see for yourself, there's a phenomenal organization called Give Directly that's a leader in this space, and in addition to tons of research, they publish live, unedited testimonials from their recipients. There's ongoing research and debate about what kinds of interventions are most effective. However, what's clear is that your dollar goes much farther in poor countries than rich ones. Let's say we care about blindness and have $40,000 to donate. That's the cost of training one seeing eye dog in the United States. For that same amount of money, you could cure 40 people's vision from blindness in poor countries. This isn't an argument to ignore the hardship of people we're close to, but it highlights how much farther our resources can go in places that have less wealth. So, while the world has made exceptional progress in the last 30 years, the number of extreme poor is still large. By the end of the next decade, some 500 million people are still expected to live in extreme poverty. We should approach this problem with humility, understanding that the reasons for poverty are complex. And while there are no simple answers, there are ways to help. Because of the massive global gap between rich and poor, even small donations can have a large impact. I'll admit that it can be unintuitive to donate to strangers you've never met. We're primed to only care about our own tribe. This is why projects like Dollar Street are so useful. They direct our attention towards shared suffering. They elevate our common humanity. They remind us that we're part of a global tribe. If you'd like to donate to GiveWell or Give Directly, there are links below. Also linked is an exceptional article about extreme poverty by a site called Our World and Data, along with these highly recommended books. Thanks for watching.